I think we're setting ourselves up here for a perfect environment for gold. Gold is going to turn very dramatically when it turns because people are so underinvested. Special coverage of the New Orleans Investment Conference is brought to you by Victoria Gold, leading Yukon's new gold rush. Welcome back to the New Orleans Investment Conference, SF Live special coverage of this fantastic event. My name is Kai Hoffman, I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the SOAR Financial Group. And I'm joined by none other than Adrian Day. Adrian Day, thanks so much for coming on. It's good well, to see you. Thank you, Kai, and, and good to see you again. It, it's great because we've, we've done an interview not too long ago, but no. virtually. It's always different in person. It it's is. It's better in person. It is. Well, so it's great to see you. Welcome to New Orleans. Thank you. Yes. Uh, first impressions of the conference. I'm always curious what, the, what your pickup of the mood <laughs> here is. You know what? I only came in late last night, had dinner, went to bed, so I don't really have an impression yet. It's so obviously a lot of people. Um, they're in there listening. That's always a good sign. Yeah. You know, as opposed to going to some conferences where everybody's just wandering around looking aimless. <laughs> But I don't really have the impressions yeah. yet, yeah. No, we'll, we'll talk about, like, you're, you're yeah. a speaker here as well. You're on yeah. the panel later. Um, what are some of the topics you're going to be talking about? Like, what's, the, the, I think your presentation is titled The Fed, Money, and Gold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's sort of everything. Yeah, that's everything. Well, that's what I'm going to be talking about in my, in my speech. Um, you know, what is, I'm going to talk a little bit about, a little bit about what the Fed has done wrong, but that's such an easy, easy target, right? <laughs> Um, and then we'll talk about what, what their policies are likely to mean for the economy and also for gold. So that will be the, that'll be the, the, the topic. We can go into that if you want. Yeah, let's, but, let's uh, dive into that a little bit because I think it's quite topical today. Like well, we're recording this on Thursday, November, uh, October 13th, I think it is. And the CPI print came out earlier this right. morning. But, but obviously the listeners will get it after I've talked. I don't want to give away my talk. Um, well, you know, I mean, clear, clearly, well, in my view, the Fed really doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, and I mean that in a literal way. They don't know what they're doing. And, and you've got people like Neil, um, uh, what's his name, Kish, Kish Karin, who's gone from an uber bear who just as recently as last year was urging the Fed to keep interest rates low, not to reduce the balance sheet, to do more of it because we needed it. Suddenly, he's an uber hawk. <laughs> now, Fine, of course, people are supposed to change their mind when circumstances change, but does, does that guy and others like him, do they have any fundamental understanding, uh, and I mean this literally, do they have a fundamental understanding of the economy and what causes inflation? I don't think they do, because otherwise they wouldn't have swung quite so dramatically as they have. And, you know, just to put a little bit of meat on that bone, so I'm not just sort of ranting, um, two weeks ago, Fed Chairman Powell, Jerome Powell, was interviewed at the monetary conference, at Cato's monetary mm -hmm. conference, which they do every year. Clearly, the questions had been sent in advance. They didn't announce that, but it was very, very clear, mostly by the way he was discreetly turning pages <laughs> to answer the questions. But in answer to a, the, the, the questioner asked, said, you know, when he was at college, Milton Friedman was popular and everybody, monetarism was a big thing and people used to rush out when the money supply figures were coming out. And Powell said that money doesn't play any significant part in our policy discussions. And I'm thinking, how can you run monetary policy without money? <laughs> when money is not important to you? Uh, it's, it's, it's flawed. So anyway, if you don't think that the money supply was a contributor or a major contributory factor to inflation, you're going to put the blame on everything else. COVID, uh, the lockdown, Putin, Russia, I was <laughs> uh, Ch Chinese lockdown, Shanghai lockdown. You're going to put your blame on everything else because you don't understand it was money. And this explains why they think it was transitory. Because they thought, well, we'll come out of the lockdown, you know, people will spend a bit more, and then it'll all go back to normal. Now, it follows from that also, if you don't understand the proper cause, then you don't understand the solution, right? <laughs> and so, and I, I, so I'm being literal when I yeah. say they don't know what they're doing. Um, and he gave it, I, I must say this, because I thought it was just perverse. <laughs> He said, you know, when you come out of lockdown, people spend more. Fine, okay. understood. 
and uh, so so one of one of the example he gave so for example he said we had a huge surge of people buying new cars <laughs> because they don't want to use public transport to go to work because they're afraid of the virus. That is just BS. That's... I mean, I don't know a single person who bought a car in 2021 or early 2022 <laughs> because they didn't want to use the bus to go to work. And especially new cars. Yes, like and if you think new cars. If you think through, if you think about that, like new cars does make any sense. No, so I, I mean, it was just, <laughs> it was just, it was just perverse that yeah. he said that. Um, so anyway, so that's one thing. So, so they don't understand. So then what it, what it probably means, I suspect that they're going to keep, I mean, the truth is they left it too long. Yeah. We all agree with that. Even some former Fed officials believe they left it too long. And, and the same goes after 2009. You know, we, we had the QE and that lasted far too long before pulling back. Low, uh, raising interest rates and pulling back on the balance sheet. But I suspect that the danger now is that they continue tightening for too long yeah. and we have a you know, serious recession. Well, it's heading that way. Like it's that heading. German government announced already 10% CPI print today as well. Yes. And 2023 looks very dire. Yes. And uh, we have other issues, of course, as well that the US doesn't have. But uh, I think it's easy to be replicated. Yeah, and yet the Fed dot plot, you know, um, your listeners probably know what the dot plot is, where the members of, 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 of FOMC make their predictions on what's going to happen with interest rates. Now, they should know that everyone's <laughs> fixing interest rates uh, on interest rates on GDP and on inflation. And they still think that inflation is going to end this year at 5.7% and next year will be 2.6%. I... I, I so they're still thinking that they're, they're going to succeed in this. And then, not coincidentally, it's going to be 2% in the long term, yeah. which just happens to be their target. <laughs> but if you really think you're, you're, you're cutting inflation to 2.6% 2, 2 next year, um, nice. then either I don't know what you're smoking or <laughs> there's going to be some pretty dramatic, yeah. pretty dr draconian policies. Like I'm, I'm coming from this from a press, pragmatic angle. I look at it, I think, I, I think about it, and it's like, if you're bringing manufacturing home, our labor costs are much higher than, than elsewhere, so right. cost of goods must automatically go, go up, or margins shrink, and I don't think companies and corporations would appreciate that. No. Right? So for me, inflation, like, and the weak US dollar, or the, sorry, the very strong US dollar is another issue that sort of fuels inflation because your input costs are much higher. Of course, of course. No, absolutely, you're right. So, and, a, and again, you look, you saw the print today, you, you referred to the print today, but you know, you look at producer prices, and of course in <laughs> Germany, they're 30 something. Yeah. Um, so you look at the producer prices and then you look at, before that in the supply chain, you look at commodity prices. If commodity prices are going up um, what, what was the last year in commodity prices? They've come off a little bit recently, but we're probably talking 18% overall. Yeah. That's going to flow into your producer prices. And if your producer prices are up, let's, let's forget Germany for a second. Yeah. If your producer prices are up 13% in the last year, that is going to flow into, cons <laughs> into consumer prices. Yeah. That's um, what we're seeing right yes. now. Right? It's, it's mind-boggling, but let's talk about the consequences for gold yeah. and what we're looking at. Like, gold had an interesting trading day today, and I don't want to talk too timely on uh, comment on dollar moves, but it was down sharply, it recovered, and uh, we didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. You know, we've seen that a few times in the last, really, last two weeks. You know, since the dollar had that peak and fell, yeah. and since the Bank of England... Yeah. Um, <laughs> The Bank of England uh, said, well, we were going to start tightening on Friday, but I think we're going to now start easing again. Unbelievable. And, and I mean, we can talk about England if you want, because I, I need to, you know, I, I, I'm English, so I don't want to make it. But, um, and, but since that time, gold has had some interesting, some interesting yeah. days, some interesting trades, where it will fall immediately, but then come back pretty quickly. That to me is a sign of underlying strength. There's people now, there are people now, I think, two weeks, you know, isn't a long time, 
but I think there's now people willing to buy gold on any dip. We didn't really see much of that sort of a month ago, two months ago, six months ago. So that's a very, very encouraging sign, I would say. Very encouraging. You, you brought up the, the event, the British event, where they did yeah. pretty much QE by bailing out the pension funds, by providing some liquidity to them. And uh, the reaction in the market was really, really interesting. Like, I, I spoke with, uh, I think it was Brent Cook this morning, Brian oh, London, yeah. and uh, they said it was a proof of concept day. Or we. Yes, yes, right? yes, so. absolutely. No, absolutely. And, you know, to me, that whole thing, what, what often happens, you, you know this as well as I do, everybody in the markets knows this, so when a market is, when, when you're in the middle of a bull market, bad news is ignored. When you're middle of a, when people are looking for reasons to buy, they'll look for reasons to buy. And, and I think that's what you're at right now. Yeah. There's a great sense that the, that the tightening, the economies are not strong enough to withstand the tightening. Maybe that's the way to put it. And, you know, you step back from what the Bank of England did and, and said, well, the pension funds blew up, but why did the pension funds have a problem? And everyone's blaming it on, on the cut in the surcharge, not the actual nominal rate, but the, 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 the surcharge tax rate for higher income from uh, 50 to 45 or mm -hmm. something. That nominally would reduce government government income by three billion, uh, by 30 billion, yeah. sorry. In a three trillion dollar economy, that's, that's a small number. Yeah. So at, at, at worst, this was a bad messaging, you know. Uh, it, yeah. it, in itself, it was not a major event. And people seem to, people seem to have totally misunderstood that. They think, oh my gosh, cutting the rate of income tax by five percentage points on higher earners, they're going to destroy the budget. You know, that's nonsense. Now, I'm not defending the government because their plans for, for uh, subsidizing yeah. energy use are just, I mean, they're so overblown. And they're also perverse. <laughs> If you have a problem with supply of energy, you need to cut consumption, not subsidize consumption. <laughs> Isn't that pretty basic? Isn't that pretty or obvious? Or you, you increase supply. Wow. That's another. Yeah, That's another let's not thing. go there. Let's not go there. <laughs> right? It would make sense. but Of course it would. Of course uh, it would. Nah. Um, Adrian, let's, let's circle yeah. back to stocks a little bit yeah. and sort of your predictions for the next three to six months. Uh, we're in sort of the, the beginning of tax loss season. I heard many investors already sold. Yeah. Like so, I'm curious, like, what you expect to happen? Are we talking primarily gold stocks? Oh, uh, right? yeah. mining stocks. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, a couple of things. One is on on the tax loss. Yes, uh, there's a lot of people with some pretty significant tax losses this year. But unlike last year and the year before, they've got losses in a lot of sectors this year. What are you going to write it off so, against? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So last year, I was saying we're going to have a pretty vicious tax loss selling seasons because. That's the only place, mining stocks are the only place people have losses. Now you can write, you can sell all sorts of stuff and get losses. So that's one factor to bear in mind. Um, I suspect some people have already sold. I mean, I know anecdotally people have just given up in the last couple of months. So we've already seen some selling. But I, I still think the junior sector, I'm, I hate to say it, I hate to say it here at this conference, but I think the junior sector is going to see some more pain. Some yeah, more some selling. more pain. Some yeah, more pain. Some more yeah. pain. And it might be specifically tax loss, or it might just be, you know, things build on themselves. But having said that, you know, I mean, my outlook is for stagflation. I'm not alone in that. If you look at stagflation over the last 50 years, the late 70s being the prime example, but not the only example, gold and other commodities, gold is your best performing asset. And commodities generally are your second best performing asset. So I think, I think we're setting ourselves up here for a perfect environment for gold. It's taken a little longer than I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll admit that. But gold is going to turn very dramatically when it turns because people are so underinvested. So that's the first thing. People are really underinvested in gold. So when things turn, you'll get a pretty good move. And it's going to turn when either the dollar um, falls, and we don't have time to talk about that maybe, <laughs> or when people come to understand that the Federal Reserve and other central banks simply are not going to succeed in their plan of bringing inflation down to 
without causing a major recession. I mean, they're still talking about a soft landing in the United States. Yeah. They think they can bring inflation down to 2% or nominal, you know, uh, consumers inflation down to 2% and still have a soft landing. I, I don't see that. I no. just don't see that. No, we talked about it earlier. It's like, if you think about it, all the trends that are happening, yeah. it's just not possible. And yet, if you look at investor, if you look at investors, investor expectation surveys, you look at the tips, you look at bonds, you look at gold, investors are believing the narrative at the moment. Most investors continue to believe the Fed. You look at investor expectations for inflation, for next year, that's 2.8, I think. So very close to what the Fed yep. is. And for 2024 onwards, is 2%. So investors are believing the Fed. When investors stop believing the Fed narrative and realize that they cannot achieve their goals, I think gold will turn. So gold will turn when that happens. Gold will turn dramatically because people are underinvested in gold. And, and then on the gold stocks, you look at the senior gold stocks today, the producers, and they are selling close to 20-year lows in valuation. You know, it's, it's crazy. You look at uh, the XAU, the Index of Senior gold, mining, uh, gold and Silver Mining Stocks in the U.S. Now, admittedly, it includes a couple of the, well, it includes the royalty companies, <laughs> which have very high valuations. Yeah. So what I'm about to say is even more dramatic. The XAU, yeah. other than that last quarter of 2015, is trading at the lowest price to free cash flow in 20 years. That's, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Because we're all complaining about the price of gold and gold didn't go up and everything else. But you look at, let's just say, Barrick. Barrick's all in sustaining cost is $1,000. Gold is $1,650. they are making money. They're making a better than 30% profit margin. This is, this and a 5% is, dividend yield. And a 5%. This is not a disaster, <laughs> right? And their cash costs are under 900 and they're not alone. I just yeah. say Barrett. Oh, no, Newman is the same. Yes. Newman also five percent dividend. <laughs> and so, so these companies are making money here. So the only reason, well, the only reason not to say gold stocks are cheap is either you think the gold price of gold is going to go down to eleven hundred, or you think the costs are going to go up dramatically. And costs will go up, but I don't think they will go up to offset those profit margins. No, absolutely fantastic, Adrian. Yeah. We got to cut it here. Great conversation, well, as you. always. Appreciate you coming on. Where can we find more about you? Oh, uh, yes. My website is... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Was it Adrian Day Asset Management what is com? It? I don't know what it is. <laughs> yes. We'll put it in the comments. A we'll put it in the description. Adrian Day Asset Management com. That's it. Adrian yeah. Day Asset Management com. Fantastic. Thank awesome. You. Good luck with your presentation later. Well, thank you. <laughs> and thank you, uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. SF Live special coverage from the New Orleans Investment Conference. We were joined by Adrian Day of Adrian Day Asset Management. Leave a comment, leave a like, subscribe to the channel. We much appreciate you. Thank you so much. We'll be back with lots, lots more content.